I see a lot of people falling into this self-serving bias that, oh, I'll just pay off the debt and be free, right? You know, you know, you're not free because that debt is still a lazy debt because you're not using the debt to your advantage. Hello and welcome to Help Me Buy Property Podcast. I am your host, Cheryl Leong, with my amazing co-host, Mox and Reza. Hey, Mox, how are you doing? Hello, how are you today? How does it feel I'm to be amazing. in the hot seat, Cheryl, today? I know, that is my first intro. And we're going to be talking about a really cool topic which comes up all the time, right? Is the question as to, should I buy property to live in? to begin my property journey, or should I rent, right? And we're going to be covering some key key topics and questions that come up, um, a few of them being the pros and cons of buying to live in or rent vesting is another term. What are the, some of the rules for buying a property to live in, which is also known as your principal place of residence? When you're rent vesting, like, you know, when you're moving from rent vesting to getting your PPOR and when should you buy your PPOR first before you invest in property? So, you know, there are a few considerations here. As we always say, you know, none of this is financial advice. We are, we get advice from your accountants, your financial advisors for your personal situations. However, we're going to be sharing some of our own stories at we must yes. and you know what you've done what i've done the pitfalls and also hopefully some of the wins around it as well so we're ready to rock and roll yeah let's do this um let's kick off awesome. with the pros and cons uh, i think you know let's get that list out to see what the pros are if i take a step back cheryl do you have are you biased you know rent wasting versus principal place of residence you know what when i when I started out, I was quite adamant that I wanted to rent first. However, I guess when it's it's not so clear cut, I feel particularly if, if you're the only one that's making the decision by yourself, then I think that's easier. You can go, what is my personal situation? I'm going to rent first and so on. If you have a partner, however, it might be a little bit trickier because you may have a partner who is, you know, is really set on having their own place. Yes. Really wants that sense of ownership. And and you know what? It's like, to a certain extent, you can still make it work. I, I personally feel like looking back at my journey, like I wouldn't have done it differently. But I think as someone who, if I'm sharing, you know, my experience and someone says to me, should I buy my own property or rent best to begin with? I'm more inclined to say, unless you've got a real need for ownership at this point, right. like rent where you want to live, yeah, and buy where it makes sense. Buy where you, yeah, exactly where where it makes sense, and then you know invest as much as you can. But we're going to talk about both. Yes, I'm not going to skew the conversation. <laughs> um, but how about you? I don't want it. Like I said, I don't want it to be a killjoy. And what do they call it when it's when you spoil the movie? <laughs> um, Spoiler alert. Spoiler yeah, alert. that's right. Yes. Look, uh, I am definitely biased. I'm, I think I'm the wrong person to be talking about this, but I'll try to keep my views as unbiased as possible going into this podcast. But, you know, when my thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm always a logical thinker. And so I wasn't married when I bought my first property. And so I followed the KISS principle, you know, keep it simple, stupid or simply stupid. Right. So. I think one of the key. I thought you were telling us how you got how you got your wife, you know, before you got <laughs> we got married. Just kiss everyone. <laughs> well, that's Margaret, another way it's a to different. look at it. <laughs> it's, a it's a different kiss principle. But I think it's it's interesting. I saw my friends, you know, buying properties because it was a cultural norm to buy your own place to live in and you know be the shine of the society. So you know, I was one of those you know, uh, should I call ugly duckling or the the black sheep, you know, in the, in the cultural norms where, you know, I decided to buy a property and to rent it out. And so I think there are certain things that I did right, but there are certain things that I did completely wrong, right? I started off in Melbourne, yeah. for example, you know, and rents in Melbourne are yeah. dirt cheap. And, you know, this is me going back almost, what, 20 years now. 
uh, not 20 years, almost 15 years. And so starting you off are at Melbourne. You're only 28. What are you talking about? Well, yeah, I'm 36. So yeah, I'm, I bought my first property at 21. So almost 16 years, right? So yeah. yeah. Look, I mean, there were definitely better opportunities out there. And as I traveled more, I realized, you know, where did I went wrong? But, you know, starting off at Melbourne, you know, that's where, you know, I kicked off my thinking, yeah. you know, better asset selection. You know, I thought that, you know, I could get in with the lower deposit, et cetera, all of that great stuff. Bad thing, starting off in Melbourne, interest rates at 8.9%, fixed at 8% yeah. because I thought that this was a smart idea to do it at that time. Um, and so... Yeah, you know, completely killed my lifestyle, right? And so, again, you know, um, yeah. knowing, uh, you know, and let's talk about the cons of the rent vesting first, um, is that, you know, you don't have a place to call home. You know, you could be stressful and overstretched, you know, something that, you know, I started off with my own portfolio, right? You could, acqu you could acquire a completely wrong property. I think that would have been terrible and create a portfolio which is super, super unsustainable. I have one client right now who has been kicked out of their rental place. And so, you know, being at the, at the mercy of the landlord, I think that's another thing, right? So there's a lot of cons when it comes to rent vesting, but let's talk about the pros. You know, what do you think would be the pros when it comes to rent vesting, Cheryl? Well, there's obviously there's not as much of a, a big commitment in terms of the, the buy-in. You know, you don't have, you don't have stamp duty. It allows you, if you are disciplined, to have better cash flow. So I would also say don't, don't necessarily rent to your maximum. Give yourself a buffer. Like rent where you're, when you're starting out, so rent where it's affordable for you and, and allow yourself to build your portfolio. It also means that you can live, you can often live where you want to live, which it can be a place where it's probably more expensive, but the yields, you know, the rental yields are less. Mm. So you can afford to live in that particular area and might not be able to afford to actually buy. Definitely. Buy there. So, Definitely. you know, what I find with rent vesting is, say, places like apartments. So a lot of people don't mind living in apartments where it's a complex, where there's a pool and a gym and everything else. You don't have to pay extra for that. There's no strata fees for that. Definitely. Which is a pain if you are an owner because you've got to pay all the strata fees yes. and everything. Yes. So there's the benefit of being able to, to take leverage that and take advantage of, of those extra perks. Again, going back to rent vesting, if you are disciplined, you can build more of a portfolio with any extra income that, that you have as well. Definitely. So Definitely. Those are the you pros. make a really good um, point. I think, you know, I see a lot of people who are trying to live in selective school zones, you know, and they tend to rent in these areas where, you know, you would rent in an apartment or a townhouse because you want to be in a particular school zone. It's very, very common in Melbourne. So it's a perfect opportunity to rent there, but you are investing somewhere else and your even your principal place of residence is somewhere else, you know, and you have gone through some of those things as yeah. well, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so let's talk about the, the pros and cons of purchasing your, your PPOR, your principal place of residence to, to start off with. I like to start with the pros, you know, when I, and, and sharing a bit of my story, when, when I purchased my PPOR, you know, one of the things I wouldn't do, it was a unit. So it was a unit and I purchased it because I could afford it. I got the first home owners grant. So, you know, you, there are government schemes and government grants that do help you along with this. And you've got lower deposits or potentially no deposits if you can get a guarantee from family members or so on. So there are all these stamp duty savings and are lots of perks to buy your PPOR. And if you purchase in the right area, you do get it to be able to take advantage of any equity increase. Definitely. As well. Definitely. That's what I think is probably one of the best things there is like you, you get you take advantage of all the, the savings at the front end. Yeah. And if you buy well, you know, say you buy well, yeah. that you can then be able to leverage any equity at the back end. Yeah. However, going back to the fact that don't overextend yourself as well, because if you've got a whole lot of equity and you have no serviceability, 
then you're sort of a bit stuck again. Yes. Yes, definitely. In that aspect. And look, I think it becomes quite interesting for people who are making a lifestyle choice to, you know, buy to live in. Um, but the place where they are living is the place they cannot afford to buy. And so they overstretch themselves right. to basically go out and buy in. And I think that's a typical problem that a lot of people face that, you know, if I give you an example for Melbourne, for example, I have a particular client, you know, they were pretty keen on living in uh, McKinnon school zone. And so, you know, the average price point there is 1.4, 1.5. And so if you start there, your journey, you're starting it with a bang, you're locking in all your serviceability, you're putting in all your savings yeah. into that place. And that's it. You can't do anything else outside of that thing, you know? So yeah. it, it's, a, it's a pure lifestyle choice. And so if it's not going to be your forever home, don't start with a bank. You know, that's what I always say. If it's not your forever home, you don't need to start with the bank. You know, aim to, yeah. you know, for aim to buy a forever home and then go for a bank. Yeah, 100%. There's no issues with that. Yeah. And I think this is where the, the, the disadvantages of buying with PP, your PPR to start off with. You're absolutely right. We get so drawn into this whole, it's my dream home and I love this and it's going to be where I'm going to, Grow my family and and the bank's gonna let me borrow ninety percent and then they're gonna let me borrow a million dollars and I'm gonna go all in and your 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 max to your your eyebrows, right? Yeah. And any interest rate room and and this is where we get stuck in that rat race. Yes. In the sense. Where exactly what you said, like, you know, you might have some equity growth, but you're you're stretched to the point where you can't access any of that equity and which means then you can't, it's not, you can't, it just takes a longer time for you to build that portfolio outside of your, outside of your PPOR, which is what you want to do to be able to pay it down. So this is the irony, right? You, you want to have some leeway so that you can purchase more investment properties mm. to help you pay down your PPOR because the interest that you pay on your PPOR is not tax deductible. This is not tax advice, but general, generally is not tax deductible. Yes. Whereas if you're rent vesting, or whether if you're investing in general, the interest on that generally is tax deductible. Yes. So Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad talks about good debt and bad debt. So Mox was going to say Robert Kiyosaki. I was trying to. <laughs> You know, throw him off and say it's Kawasaki. <laughs> it's not Robert Kawasaki. But he talks about good debt and bad debt. And I like to talk about it as more so lazy debt. Yes. Whereas lazy debt doesn't really do very much. Yeah. And then smart debt, which it is you are making smarter choices with your debt, which is, you know, tax deductible and you can, you know, do all sorts of things there. Definitely. Um, yeah. So I think that's the cons there when particularly it's, it's more so when you're not clear with the strategy of how you can leverage your serviceability and your equity to build your portfolio and you're stuck. I think that's Definitely. when it's frustrating for people. Definitely. Yeah, I think a lot, a lot of people don't realize, a lot of people don't realize from a bank's perspective that, you know, when the banks are assessing your borrowing capacity, they're looking at the cash flow. And so they're looking at how much money is walking out of the door from your, you know, income perspective, right? And so when you're paying rent, it's a smaller amount. When you have borrowing, when mm. you have your own house that you're paying debt on, that is still money walking out of the door, right? And and that is significantly higher because you'd be paying principal and interest on that loan, which is quite, and you might have overcapitalized it. It generally means that, you know, you're blocking your serviceability off completely because there is no income coming out from any of these properties, right? It's just a roof over your head. And so to your point mm -hmm. that while uh, you might, you know, generate a lot of equity, if you don't do anything with the equity, you know, it's just the roof over your head. You know, uh, it's still, it's still a liability, you know, coming back to what, you know, uh, Mr. Uh, was it Ka Kiyosaki? Kawasaki? No, Kiyosaki. Kawasaki. Uh, no, no, Kawasaki. <laughs> <laughs> Kiyosaki. <laughs> Mr. Robert was saying that the house is This actually. is going to be so fun. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, look, I mean, you know, I'm a strong believer. I think it definitely makes sense that, you know, the house that you live in is actually a liability, not an asset. And predominantly because 
you know, all it's doing is the intangible nature of it, you know, putting a roof over your head and nothing else. And so there are ways you can convert this liability into an asset by using the refinance or the equity or advantage and reinvesting it and buying more investment properties. Yeah. Should yeah. you have the borrowing capacity, right? That's the most important point. If you overcapitalize and don't leave any borrowing capacity at all, that means that that equity that sits there is not going to do any good to your, you know, would not help you, yeah. you know, build your portfolio or create generational wealth. Yeah. And I guess there's a few things there to be able to allow you to do that. It's like you need to be able to be earning more. I mean, if you're in some sort of employment, get a pay rise. If you're in business, if you're in business, you've got a bit more scope because you can, you know, earn more, make more in your business and be able to access the equity and also your serviceability. Yes. One thing, you know, I... Let's talk about, I mean, some of the learnings from your own journey in terms of what are the things that you would have done differently, most in terms of how you started your your property journey? Look, my property journey definitely started off from investing and I was investing at the start. There is a culture norm in my family that, you know, you need to buy a house to live in. And so okay. I live pretty much all across the you know, various different parts of Australia. You know, I was in Melbourne first and then moved to Sydney, lived in Adelaide, lived in Brisbane, came back to Sydney, then moved back to Melbourne. And, you know, that was that last round when I actually ended up buying a property. And it's a funny story. You know, I did all of these rounds around, you know, looking at various different properties, building my portfolio. Um, but my wife was always sort of, you know, of that opinion that, you know, this guy makes me move all the time, right? And so my trigger point for me was, you know, having the first kid, right? That was the trigger point. And so as soon as the first kid happened, um, I moved back to Melbourne and the kid was still one and a half, two years old. Um, and my wife is like, I'm not going to move. This is it, you know? And so one last move, yeah. right? And so I was like, okay, that's interesting. Um, but I was still like, you know, you know, we're renting. Uh, the owner is a great friend of mine. He's given us two years lease. You know, why do we need to move, right? Because I would always go for longer lease terms so that, you know, I'm not in that mercy of the yeah. landlord to kick me out. When I came back to Melbourne, I think six to eight months in Melbourne, um, this is going back 2016, 15, I think. No, no, 2017, actually, when I bought my property to live in, I was walking down this, you know, I was passing through that particular road and I saw this property dead. No one was there. It was an open house with, well, with one of those, you know, rain white flag, you know, uh, out there, one, no. you know, smartly dressed agent. And I, and I walked inside the property and I literally walked out and I was like, wow, this is like, it was terrible, terrible property. It smelled, it was just awful looking. And I was like, okay, interesting. And so I asked him one of those brochures and I checked out his brochure and I looked at the floor plan. And so the developer in me, you know, that's what it does, right? It looks at the floor plans. And I have fallen in love with the floor plan. I was like, wow, this is, this is an awesome floor plan. And so I was thinking, okay, you know, if I can buy this house at, you know, around, you know, $500,000 mark, I can flip this at 680, 720, make a quick buck mm -hmm. and exit, right? No idea of thinking or living there, right? And so I make an offer, a random offer to the agent. The agent laughs me off and says, see you later, because I started off at 480 and he was laughing. And this is 2017. The market was still doing relatively well. You know, it wasn't cliff off the cliff at this stage, but he had no interest because the property was in stage. It was terrible looking property, all of that. Two days later, he calls me, he says, look, you know, there was a property that sold literally, you know, on the same street, around I think 575, 580, something like that. And he said, can you make a better offer? And I said, okay, um, I'll make your walk away offer of 510. And he called me like literally two hours later, he said, it's accepted, right? And so Where? now I haven't told anyone, right? Usually I'll tell my family that I'm buying a property. This is one of those, you know, spur of a moment, you know, and that, you know, okay, you know, this guy is buying a property. And so I took my wife for a drive. I still remember my father-in-law was here. Uh, I took them for a drive, stopped outside a real estate office, went in there, signed the contract, came out. And she's like, what were you doing there? And I was like, oh, I bought a house. And she's like, what? Why didn't you tell me? I was like, oh, I'll, I'll come around. I'll take you to show it to you. And so I took both of them to, you know, show the house and oh, they need just like any square they could think of, you know, they would just, it was going off, right? 
who buys this crap, who buys this, you know, shitty looking house? What are you going to do with this? And I said, look, I'm not, I'm you're not going to live here anywhere, right? So this is my pet project. I'm going to finish this off. And, and off you go from there. And they're like, okay, that's fine. And so my parents were there at that time as well. And so they were keen to come out and have a look at the property. And so I was like, okay, you know, uh, this was my, I think, third or fourth property in Melbourne. You know, excited. They came out, have a look at the property. Very close to my brother's house, by the way. They came out, looked at the property and same result. You know, a lot of swears, a lot of, you know, this guy's an idiot. You know, I don't know what he's doing with his life. It's like, okay, that's, that's fine. No problem. You know, forget, forget I bought this, right? Three month settlement, I settled the house. I bought, brought the tradies in for almost three weeks. I did pretty much everything, redid the kitchen, you know, the bathrooms, you know, a bit of renovation there, the flooring, the paints, et cetera, all of the shenanigans, right? Got the house valued at 720 and I was ready to flip. And I was like, hmm, okay, how about I show the after to the wife and the parents, right? And so, and I think that was the mistake. I don't know if it's a mistake. If my wife is listening to me, I'm really sorry. I'm calling it a mistake. But in hindsight, it's a good decision. But so I brought them into the house thinking that, okay, I'm going to sell this. And so she comes in, she's like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is like brand new kitchen, brand new house, you know, brand new house smell, awesome backyard, awesome front yard. She's like, I'm going to live here. This is it. This was my last move and I'm going to move here. I'm going to live here. I was like, okay. And so, oh, wow. and that's what we did. You know, we ended up living, we still live there. 2017 is when I bought that place. 2023, we are in right now, five years in the track. Um, the house probably ended up costing me an extra $35,000, $40,000 that I spent on the renovation. I think about 50000 because, you know, I, I did pretty much all of it myself. The valuation of the house, around a mil, over a mil right now in today's time, right? And so in hindsight, yeah. would I have done it I, any differently? Uh, no, I think uh, I think that was a perfect opportunity to basically create the value yourself while you're moving into the principal place of residence. And so yeah. I, I tend to teach a lot of people that do that, you know, buy an ugly house on the best street in the best location, spend 30, 40, 50, even hundred thousand dollar on that house, manufacture equity and call it a home. Yeah, absolutely. And I like how, you know, well, you obviously being, being a little bit sort of more, more creative and advanced in that aspect could see how you could add value mm, to definitely. the property. And so, you know, when I say immediately after you've added that value, you're able to, to sort of look at what, what equity you can access to go again. Mm. So I'm sure you've leveraged off your property to be able to purchase other, other things. And I guess where, where I'm seeing here, the lesson around this is, is that not to fall into the trap of just going into this whole, we need to buy this one property and it's going to be there, our forever home for the next 30, 40 years. And again, being sold into the narrative of the banks going, we'll lend you it and you can pay it off in 30 years. Definitely. Oh my goodness. 30 yeah. years, the amount of interest that you've paid is it's crazy. well and truly over the amount of the property itself, yeah. right? So. You know, I look back in and I go, if we're purchasing property and if it's your PPOR, have some sort of a plan in place where you can pay off that lazy debt as quickly as possible. Definitely. Or be able to leverage off equity, as much equity in that property Definitely. as possible and, and convert convert it into into smart uh, smart debt. And one point that you make, Cheryl, before was in relation to the deductible tax deductible side of things and so this is an, an amazing strategy and let's dwell a bit more deeper into this you know while you have your own principal place of residence if you have an investment property that has generated a lot of growth and you have access to that equity you can redirect that equity into an offset account on your own personal home and reduce that that yeah. to that level that you're paying the principal and not the interest at all right while right. that debt right. in the offset account is actually tax deductible, right? And so you are structuring right. it in such a way that you're releasing the equity out of um, an investment property that is going to be significantly negatively geared. For example, right. you know, you're still claiming a deduction on that debt because it's tax deduction. But you're recycling that money into your own personal offset account and placing it against your principal place so that you are hedging your own you know, interest and you're just whatever repayments that you're paying is going directly to the principal side of things. And so, you know, those are the creative strategies that people should be looking at 
when they are yeah. thinking about buying an investment property and invest in, investing at the same time. Yeah, and definitely and speak to your accountants around this because if your accountants understand property and are investors themselves, they'll be able to sort of guide you as to what are the what are the, the smart ways of structuring your finances to be able to reduce you know reduce your loan as quickly as possible and the same thing like find you know work, work with a broker as well who really understands what you're trying to achieve the long-term long-term goal and strategy i talk about you know we talk about strategy and so much of what we do i know yes. when you speak to your clients and your investors it's like what's your strategy yeah. what's your strategy to be able to get you from here to here it's the same thing with buying in terms of your PPOR. Have a strategy in place, and that strategy should be around how am I paying this off as quickly as possible? How am I increasing the equity as quickly as possible? Definitely. You know, Definitely. and reducing it. So if you're just purchasing a property and intending to sit on it for 30 years, I don't think that's going to be getting you where you need to be. <laughs> you need to look at ways to reduce that yeah. And always give yourself a bit of a goal. Like if it's a 10-year goal, how, what are the things that I need to put in place? Help me draw down and draw down as much equity and pay down the, the lazy debt as Definitely. quickly as possible. Definitely. And so that you, and, to, and, and if that, that ends up being your, your strategy, yeah. And to add to that, you know, we are not just saying that pay down your debt, you know, that lazy debt can be, you know, repurposed into a debt that basically generates more income for yourself. So it's not just about, because I see right. a lot of people falling into this self-serving bias that, oh, I'll just pay off the debt and be free, right? right? You, know, you know, you're not free because that debt is still a lazy debt because you're not using the debt to your advantage. So refinance yes. Yes. and invest, basically yes. go back in again and generate income out of that debt rather than just putting a roof over your head. Now, I was going to, I was going to also talk about and we'll probably get to this as, as well. Like at what point, you know, not saying that you, you don't purchase a, a PPOR and if you go into rent vesting, again, have a strategy in terms of at what point do you want to pur purchase your PPOR and purchase it, whether it's almost debt free or very, very small debt that you're paying it off as quickly as possible. Definitely. What are the things that you're, you know, it'd be great to hear around the strategies where you're talking through with investors going, all right, how many investment properties do I need to purchase? And what's my strategy and how many years till I get to the point where I go, I can afford First. PPOR in the location that I want? Yeah. And it's very bespoke. Like I know people say 10 properties in 10 years or, you know, five properties gets you freedom. You know, I, I truly don't believe that there is a magical number. I strongly believe that everyone follows their own unique strategy. It's like a fingerprint. You cannot replicate someone's strategy to something else. And ultimately it depends on where you are in your life. What sort of risk appetite do you follow? What sort of earnings do you make? And so that would define how much growth do you need to catch and how much passive income targets do you have? You know, so it's it's very unique in that sort of opportunity. I'll give you a typical example, right? We know that, you know, if you buy a co-living space, which is nine bedroom, nine bathroom, you know, you can generate almost $120,000, $130,000 worth of income on a gross level. On a net level, you can generate an income yeah. of close to about, you know, forty dollars to $50,000 if you're buying regional Victoria, for example, right? And so two of those properties, it's almost like $100,000 in net income. Can you retire? No, but because, yeah. your, you know, your net wealth is not there. And so you can't just say that two properties would get me there or five properties would get me there. Um, it's just a matter of how do you scale your portfolio in a sustainable manner that you're catching growth, you're catching cash flow, and you're giving your property portfolio an opportunity to have multiple exit strategies should something happen to your life, to macro environment, et cetera, so that you, you, know, you can descale and quickly deleverage and still protect your passive income in the net wealth. You know, that's the key goal, you know, and so it's, it's different for sure. everyone. Like if I talk about my portfolio in specific, and that would be a typical example, you know, I follow an active property investment strategy, okay? And so I have, assets that generate significant amount of cash flow, but then everything else is full-scale developments, you know, and that's what I do into. I have a small pipeline of 
properties that I acquire, but they convert into development properties in the future anyway. And so, you know, not everyone can follow my strategy or not everyone can replicate my strategy on day dot, but they can replicate in five, six, seven years time. And so yeah. it's not a yeah. get rich quick scheme. Anyone who says 10 properties in three years, 30 properties in five years, um, I, I, it sounds very gimmicky to me. And I always say, take a step back, try to understand what your target is, what you're trying to achieve yeah. and work backwards from there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. And it's important to also understand your numbers around it. Yes. You know, um, I realized early on was like, oh, I want to be financially free. I want to be financially free, you know, and a lot of us are aiming towards that. But do we actually know what our financial freedom number is? Definitely. Have we actually sat down? Like we need to actually sit down and go, well, if I didn't have my PPO or our mortgage, and I, and this is the amount that I, you know, my, my daily expenses, how much is the minimum that you actually need yeah. to live your, your day-to-day -day life? Definitely. And then work out then what are the bonus things like holidays and everything else. And you might, you know, you, you come up with a number that you go, oh, okay, well, it's for example, 150,000 or 200,000, whatever that might be, yeah. right? It could be 500,000. That's okay. But you need to have a number just like anything else for a goal and then come up with some sort of a strategy, strategy. that allows you to get Definitely. to that point. Like you said, whether it's rooming houses or other investments or developments, yeah. and that's I, possible. I see clients coming to me and I say that the number is important, but also the time frame that you're giving yourself. Um, I have a client who came to me, he was 36. He said, I want to retire by the age of 40. He has two properties and he said, I want to retire on $300,000 worth of passive income. And I said, is that realistic? And mm. look, I mean, I can get you there, but your risk appetite needs to be here. It can't be low level risk yeah, appetite, you know, for you to achieve $300,000 worth of passive income in four years. Yes, I can set up a strategy and you'll get there. But, you know, you would be taking significant amount of risk. So does that align to yeah. your risk appetite, right? So that's the key question. Yes. A lot of people, when you talk about rent vesting versus buying a property to live in, you know, think about, you know, um, that this it's it's an event that's going to happen in the future, right? Or it's going to happen X, Y, and Z, you know, based on the strategy. Yeah. I, I, I always think about this, that, you know, you don't need to do anything with the big bang, you know, the idea with property investing is to enter as quick as possible and let the compounding play its part, right? You know, forget yeah. the data, forget anything, right? Forget all the property profits, property gurus, forget this podcast, forget anyone, right? You know, th you think in the simplest manner, if you think about the long-term goal, any property that you pick in the Australian market right now is going to double in price at least 15 years down the track and average decent property 15 years down the track would double in price and so you need to give every property 15 years right yes you know we do that in seven years six years five years you know because you identify hot spots or growth areas great but if you don't want to use the help and if you want to do it successfully yourself then ultimately you want to give every property 12 to 15 years and so the more you acquire the quicker you acquire and give that compounding leeway you would get there in 15 years time and so that's why you know, 20 to 30 is a perfect opportunity because by the time you hit 50 and you had four properties or five properties, you're almost doubling, you know, the equity or the, the market cap that you would have on those properties, right? So you know, right. that's the logical right. thinking. Yeah, yeah. And it's a long, it, it is a long-term game and it does help if the earlier that you start, but it's also good to understand Again, we talk about the strategy, like what you're heading towards as well, yeah. what you're heading towards. And, yeah. and, and often, you know, like I said, if you're purchasing something like which has multiple incomes or, you know, whether it's rooming or dual occupancy or something which allows you to do some level of development, there are always creative ways to, to leverage that definitely. as well. So definitely, yeah, I think, I think that covers quite a bit in terms of, you know, how you can add value to, to your properties. Yeah. What are some of the rules for buying? Like, say if you if you are someone who is going to want to buy their principal place of residence. Yeah. Like I said before, my first property I did buy was my PPR, but because I leveraged my first homeowners grant and everything else, but it was an apartment. And I look back at it and I go, I should have bought an apartment. 
what are some of the things to consider? And yeah, look, you're, you're right in saying, I think property choice is very, very important together with the suburb selection, right? So, you know, the first one that, you know, takes, you know, the first prize is, you know, the worst street in the best suburb. The suburb selection is the key when it comes to, you know, buying your principal place of residence, right? And so, you know, if you're making a lifestyle choice, even then, you know, there are good pockets and bad pockets of that particular suburb. Yes, that suburb might be a mature suburb, for example. You know, you're buying in Point Piper, for example, right? So, you know, buy the worst house on the best street of the suburb. Well, should I, you know, not even the worst house, an average looking house, right? That right. you can add value to, or you can see that the floor plan is flowing really, really nicely. And you can discount the price on the paint and the locks. And, you know, don't be emotionally driven by, oh, it doesn't have a dishwasher or, oh, you know, the roof has a bit of stain or, oh, the kitchen is a bit too dated, you know, because yeah, ultimately, yeah. cosmetically, you can change a lot of these stuff, you know, um, as you go along. But the land is something yeah. that you can't replace. Yeah. And, and look, so the location, obviously, and then if you can see where there are other properties on that street where they've sold for significantly more than what your property is worth, yes. then they've already started to set a bit of a, a precedence of what's possible. Definitely. Um, so in that case, you know, that's an interesting point. Uh, worst house, best street. Would you, and I'm not saying that it's advice, would you stretch yourself to purchase that property knowing that it has potential, it has potential? Well, you know what I mean? It depends, right? You know, if I have the money to renovate it and I can make it yeah. the four hour home, then yeah, why not? You know, if I have the cash flow to manage it as well, I always think it in a very simplistic term again, how much is the rent that I'm paying and what is the damage that is going to happen when I move into this house? And can I keep it relatively similar? If I can't keep it relatively similar, then that means that the price point is not right or I'm not ready to acquire a principal place of residence yet. Now, of course, you know, when you move from a rental property to a principal place of residence, you always pay principal. And so you go a bit higher, right? Because, you know, that's yeah. that's naturally how the banks work. But if you have been rent wasting, you can redirect some of that money to keep that interest payment down and pay principal faster. And so it comes down to where you are in your life. I keep coming back to the same point. I wouldn't overcapitalize emotionally on a property unless and until it's my forever home. I know that I'm going to live here for 20 years or I'm going to retire here. You know, I was, I yeah. would always think that, okay, I'm going to buy, catch a bit of growth. I'd probably move to somewhere else. And so this would not be my forever home. But for some people, it might be that the forever home. And then in that case, if, if this, the, the stage is right from a strategy perspective, why not? What's stopping you? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Again, having a plan in place as to what you're going to do and, and knowing what you're going to be able to do to leverage any of that extra equity or serviceability. Also, let's talk about in terms of the rules of buying your PPR. We talked about buying in the worst, you know, worst street, sorry, best, best street, worst or average house. Yes. We talked about, you know, what are the things you can do to be able to sort of you know, renovate it to be able to access some equity there. What about exit strategies? What are the things to consider there? Because we all have this best intentions to live in a property for a long time, if it's your PPOR. Yeah. However, circumstances change and so on and so forth. And we might have to then rent it out or so mm. on. Yes. Well, what are the, some of the considerations you reckon that need to be taken into account? Well, you know, the first one, situation. the first one would always be, you know, thinking about manufacturing e equity, you know, can I add instant value to this property, a brand new flooring, re renovated, you know, brand new carpets, a bit of an updated kitchen, a brand Perfect. new, you know, wet areas, toilet, bathroom, you know, a lot of these things don't cost a lot. You know, people get scared of these things because they think that, oh, just because a house costs in today's time 350000 to build. A kitchen would, you know, to an average kitchen or even a decent looking kitchen. And I'll share some of those pictures, you know, when this podcast goes live after what my old kitchen and a new kitchen looks like. It costed me yeah, literally $12,000 to, to upgrade the kitchen, right? You know, I sourced my own stone. 
um, you know, I got the cabinet maker and custom design pretty much everything. Yes, it is four years old. And, you know, some people would complain and say, hey, you know, the, the build work significantly cheaper back then than now. But even in today's time, the wet area or a bathroom, you know, does not cost more than $15,000 to renovate, right? So think about how can you quickly add value to the property. Okay, that would right. be number one. Number two, in relation to the multiple exit strategies, scenarios out of things would be, think about the suburb selection, you know, follow the data, right? Look at the demand and the supply side of things and identify whether this suburb or this area in particular is on the growth cycle. You know, would you catch instant growth coming on to this property or buying this particular property? Yeah, that's another, you know, key takeaway. And the third thing that I see a lot of people doing right now is more, you know, buying places where they have a granny at the back or, or mm. a dual income house. And, you know, they naturally generate a side income, you know, through Airbnb, et cetera. Of course, they don't yeah, want to true. put a long-term tenant in there. And, and it's a bit of a gray area. Again, you know, seek your tax advice and financial advice if you want to. Uh, but, what the screen, right? Yes, <laughs> definitely. But, you know, putting a tenant in there you know, which you're not claiming and not exposing yourself to capital gains tax on your own principal place of residence is quite the key, you know, when you're generating income out of it. But people use that, you know, as a side business, you know, side income, you know, using those granny flats, et cetera. And so there are various ways you can, you know, have, um, um, you know, thinking about, you know, what I need to do with this. You know, I have a few right. clients who went in and buying in their principal place of residence and they had an old house at the front and they said, Whilst so we are going to survive here for the next two years, but we are going to build another house at the back um, and then renovate the front and move ourselves to the back. A perfect strategy to save capital okay. gains, still make money and pay off your loan faster. It's a perfect, perfect strategy. You know? Yeah, and, I really, I really like those. I really, and, and again, where you have, I've always liked where you have sort of almost like a dual occupancy type site type property and you are able to rent rent one side um yes one of our one of our neighbors where we are i mean they're they're an older couple so what they've done is they've built a three-story property with a lift which allows them to go from the garage all the way up to where they are at the top floor yeah but airbnb the middle the middle portion nice very smart. again seek but yes. you know, seek seek accounting advice and mm. financial advice in terms of the tax implications from that aspect. Yeah. But if you're looking at that, that that that's helping you with paying off your your debt Definitely. quicker. You know, so Definitely. I don't, you know, we we started off going one of the pros and the cons of PPOR and rent vesting, and there's no. There's no hard and fast rule. There's no rent vesting is the best thing in the world. Yes, definitely. It is great. Yeah. However, you can also start out with your PPOR and do it in a really clever way yes. as well. There's one of and the strategies. as long as you've got a clear idea. One of the strategies that I've seen a client recently do, and I really, 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 really like it. And um, I've seen a lot of people now doing it, you know, since that, that has happened and this was six months ago. A client bought a place, which I personally don't prefer, right? I don't like house and land packages. And so I'm not a big fan of, you know, people buying house and land packages, right? Sure. And a lot of people who are, you know, student investors would potentially stay away from it. But this is an interesting strategy. So he bought a six by six rooming house or he built a custom design six by six rooming house, but he did it in such a way that that house can be you know, livable and be converted into almost living space for him to basically live there in the future. Okay. And this is a premium property in Melbourne that he basically did that. And he said, the most, the only reason I'm doing this is because I can see myself living in that suburb, but I can't afford to live there right now. But what I'll do is mm. I'll buy this, I'll get this paid off to like say 50% or 40% of 30% debt. And then I'll convert using the same equity and I'll, then I'll move in there. What a smart way to think about it, right? It's an amazing strategy. Yeah. And this is the thing. It's like knowing where you want to be in the next five, 10 years and, and coming up with some way, some, you know, a, a creative solution to, to make it happen. Definitely. Um, I really like that. It's like him, him having this awareness of going, I can still do what I need to do in the meantime, which will allow me to get to my goal, which is purchasing that property in this suburb. So that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's clever. Yeah. 
And so the final question, and this is like the, the epitome of all the questions when it comes to rent vesting versus buying your forever home or, or principal place to live in, is that if you have an opportunity to buy both, which one would you buy first? Oh, this is, this is where can you, can you buy both? <laughs> well, yes. You just said if I had the opportunity to buy both, which should I buy first? Yes. Yes. I mean, he has an opportunity to buy both, but one property has to come in first. He can't get both properties at the same time, potentially. Like you can potentially get both properties at the same time, but is there a preference as to, okay, you should buy rental property first versus principal place of residence? I'd say the, the, the rental property first, and then you get income, which also helps towards your serviceability. It is. And if you've got the ability to, then then purchase the PPOR. Definitely. Um, but ensure that you're you're not putting too much of your equity in the too much of your capital into your investment property so that you can reduce the PPOR debt as quickly as possible. Definitely. Definitely. That would be what I that's mm. that's what I do. Yeah. But again, that doesn't necessarily mean it applies, but I'm thinking it from a way of serviceability yes. and access to equity. Yeah, definitely. Look, I mean, if I had the money to buy both, I would definitely do the same. I'll go and buy an investment property first and I would try to create value out of that investment property and push that valuation up sure. a bit and then extract yeah. the equity from yeah. that property and then buy a principal place of residence because, you know, I don't want to use my own equity to buy the principal place of residence. And so if I can do that through an investment property, that would be perfect. Uh, would my younger self yeah. would have done this? I probably don't think that <laughs> uh, because the younger self didn't have you and me, you know, talking and listening to a podcast. Uh, so yeah, but you know, I think that's a smarter way to do it. You know, the banks would still love you because you have an income generating asset. You're not blocking your serviceability. And yeah. so they'll still give you more money for your principal place of residence. Yeah. Yeah, because um, and, and what's something that you brought up before? Once you get your PPOR, it does impact your serviceability as to how much you can borrow. So, and that's why the investment properties, the 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 lenders look at it and go, "Well, you're likely to get a beginning income, so that's why it it looks more favorably at your serviceability." Speak to your mortgage broker who really understands the investment space, so that you can be really clever with how you structure your loans. Yeah. So structuring again, yes. structuring and strategy, those are the two S words that you want to be aware of yes. so that you can get to where you want to be. Even better if you sit down with your mortgage broker and say, this is my plan, how can we make it happen? All right? You're a mortgage broker and your accountant and then you need financial, you know, property consultant or whichever that can help you structure things so that you can get to where you need to be. I think that's a perfect note to close of the podcast. Um, amazing. Amazing, amazing. That was fun. This was great fun. Thank you for listening to all the listeners. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed. <laughs> wow, I'm, sh I'm shy of for words. For those of you who are listening, I was going to say, I was going to say, for, the, for those of you who are listening, I'd love to hear your comments and, and share your experience in terms of what you've done previously or what you're doing at the moment what's working for you did you decide to buy your PPOR or you decide to rent vest love to hear from the audience as to what your thoughts are and if anything has changed you know after listening to to the both of us you know have a little bit of a chin wag around PPORs and rent vesting so hope you found this entertaining and valuable we will see you in our next episode Thank you very the much. Help Me Buy Property podcast. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Moss. See you later. Thank you, Cheryl. Take Thanks. care. Bye. Keep smiling. Stay safe. Adios. Ciao.